To him, even silence is praise. For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth. All that is seen and unseen, he is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God. He rides across the heavens to help you, across the skies in majestic splendor. For he is the one all of humanity comes before with amazing wonders and with awe-inspiring displays of power. Everyone, everywhere, looks to him, for he is the confidence of all the earth. Last week in Wind and Fire, we were talking about worship. We're talking about uh, having a heart to worship what God wants to do through our worship in our lives. And we looked at some elements of what worship is. And the, the first is this, that we are, we are worshipers, that we are born and created as worshipers. And some of you may say, Jason, I'm not a religious person. And again, didn't say that you were. I did say that you're a worshiper. So whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus or even this morning you find yourself outside of that relationship with him, you're worshiping something. Something is sitting on the throne of your life, someone or something this morning. Why? Because we are wired, we are created by God to be worshipers. The second thing is that worship is a whole life response to who God is and what he does. In other words, it's everything about us. It's not just this one segment of 20 minutes in the service that we just experienced. It's not even just a Sunday. Worship is bigger than that. It's all of our life. It encompasses every element and every aspect of who we are and what we do in response to who he is and what he has done. And then finally, worship is wholehearted surrender. So if you missed last week, that's kind of encapsulates what we talked about. But I would encourage you to go and download our app. Uh, we've had a lot of people already do that. You can really easily get the information, find the messages just within the app itself, and even take notes and have a Bible reading plan. All that stuff you can find right there in our app, which is pretty cool. Hey, who's down? I'm going to do a, a raise, like raise your hands if you've, if you've already downloaded the app. Look at, okay, well done. Those of you who have not yet, we have some, we have an app se section out in the lobby, we ha still have those cards. All you have to do is actually take a photo, scan of it. It'll take you right to the app to download. Really, really simple way to do it. But I would encourage you to, uh, to go out and get that. Well, let's pray, and then we'll start week two of Wind and Fire. Here we go. Father, we just thank you for your grace. God, I thank you for every person that is here this morning. You love them. You know them by name. You know every concern, every issue of the heart this morning. God, we pray that you would anoint our hearts to receive, that you would anoint our ears to hear what you have specifically designed for us this morning. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for all that you're going to do. In your mighty name, we pray. A Amen. All right, well, how many of you like networking? Like, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about going to the awkward event where you're you know, handing out business cards and that kind of thing, like the, you know, those network hosting events. Have you ever done that? I've done a few of them. They are a little bit, you know. You got to really love them to do them. That's all I'm saying. I'm not talking about necessarily that kind of networking, but I'll give you an example of maybe we should call it connecting rather than networking. But I'll give you an example of my own, just recently in my life, we're just kind of navigating an issue and saying, God, I really need wisdom on this. So who can I talk to to get a different perspective than my own on this particular issue? And so I rang a friend of a friend and said, hey, could we have lunch? 
And this person said, sure, well, it'll be a little while before I can do it, but love to have lunch with you. So I eventually was able to go and have lunch with them. And they kind of talked through the scenario and said, what do you think about this? And he said, well, you need to talk to this guy and maybe this guy. And so what did I do? After our meeting, I went and I called the next person who said, you know what? Gave me some really good information, but said, I can't help you, but I know a guy who might be able to help you. So I called that guy, and then that individual, thank God, was able to give me not just the information I needed, but a lot of wisdom on the very issue that I had. How many knows it's, it's great to have friends who have friends who can help us navigate stuff? Now, I've got a, a really great personal friend, and I've got to admit, I get a little angry with him from time to time. He could be the most thoughtful gift giver I have ever met. As a matter of fact, sometimes I just go, I'm, I'm done. Like, he'll do something, I go, I just can't compete with that. I'm just, I'm hanging it up, man. That's ridiculous. Just a, re- a thoughtful gift giver, not in extravagance of price, but in thoughtfulness of selection, where what is given means more, even though it may have been lesser in monetary value, it means more because of the thoughtfulness that was put into it. I love this guy. As a matter of fact, on many occasions when I've been in the, the other seat of somebody approaching me and saying, hey, I really need wisdom on a situation, this is a name I, I would often give to someone. Hey, I may not be able to help you with this specific thing, but I know a friend who would be great for you to have a conversation with. Now, why do I do that? One, I'm happy to. I know this guy. I know him personally. I trust him. I know his character. I know who he is. I believe in him. And if I'm saying to someone, hey, I really think you should talk to him, it means that I believe that he can add value to that situation or to that person's life. You know, when I'm in a conversation with someone, I'm a little bit ADD, so sometimes my mind is bouncing a little bit. If you've ever had a conversation with me, you probably go, oh, Awesome. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm dealing with a situation, you go, okay, well, I, I'm always thinking, hey, you know what? Who do I know who could, if I can't help, and hopefully I can in some way, but if the least I could do is say, I know someone I'd love to introduce you to who'll be able to help you with that specific issue that you're dealing with. Now, I don't know a single person, and if you're out there, man, God bless you, and maybe a little bit of good luck, who would say to me, if I told them, hey, I know a friend who has never steered me wrong. I have a friend who every time I have asked for wisdom has given me wisdom, and not just wisdom, but the right kind of wisdom for the situation that I'm dealing with. A friend who always has my best interest in mind. Someone who is infallible in character and integrity. Someone who loves me and is for me and will always be for me and always has a desire to help me, I don't know very many people who would say, yeah, I don't need friends like that. I'm, really? No, I, I'm okay on my own, all good, thank you, but no thank you. But oftentimes we do. Because the reality is we all have a friend who wants to be in your life, who wants to give you wisdom, who wants to help guide you in truth, who wants to counsel you and comfort you and lead and guide and direct you, and his name is the Holy Spirit. And yet for many of us in many churches, we completely ignore him. And we're kind of like the person who would say, hey, I don't need that kind of friend in my life. I don't need someone who will lead me in truth, who will comfort me, who will help me. I'm just not interested in that. So this morning, I want to introduce all of us to a friend of mine, and his name is the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. He says this to the Corinthians with regard to Jesus, with regard to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He says this, this amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and listen to this, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, the moment I say the Holy Spirit, something's popping up in your mind. 
And some of the things that are popping up in your own mind may not be so good. I understand that in a room filled with people, we're going to have a very broad spectrum of belief, prior teaching, and prior experiences when it comes to the Holy Spirit, of who he is. So you may be on one spectrum here, and you may have a friend who you are sitting next to is on the way other spectrum over here. That's okay. Look at Acts 19, 1 and 2. This is about 10 years after the day of Pentecost, 10 years after the Holy Spirit had come. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and, ar- interior and arrived at Ephesus. And they answered, he met a group of people there, and he said, no, we have not even, heard- oh, well, I jumped, didn't I? So there they found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this was their answer. No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. This is in the New New Testament, New Church age. And there were believers who said, I've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. So we could have people this morning who are sitting just like the folks in the New Testament saying, I haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. That's on one spectrum. The other spectrum of I've heard of the Holy Spirit. And all the things I've heard are not good. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do this morning. I'm going to ask us to kind of, as best as you can, let us all wipe the slate clean. Let's come into this conversation. That's what it's going to be this morning, more of a conversation about who the Holy Spirit is and what his role is in our life, I'm going to ask all of us to say, you know what? All these things, my experience, maybe prior stuff, this morning I'm going to take a look. I'm going to ask us to do something, say let's let what the Bible says and really look to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit to kind of shape and form. Now this is just an introductory thought in the context of a series on worship. Now I'm going to Go somewhere with this because it does matter to our worship. The Holy Spirit matters when it comes to the the way that we worship and the way that we interact and connect with God. So here's the first, first thing about the Holy Spirit, and that is that he is God. Now, a lot of times, man, we love to talk about God the Father. We love to talk about Jesus. But it's almost like, we forget to mention the Holy Spirit. And we'll focus on God the Father. We'll focus on what Jesus has done at the cross. And then we just kind of forget about that third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into the doctrine of the Trinity, but if you take a glass of water, put some ice in it, don't fill it up all the way, and then put some cellophane over it, you're going to have water in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Different states, same essence. It's a little bit of a picture of the Trinity. It's different aspects, same essence of who he is. He's God. He is Father He is Son. He is Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at what the Bible teaches, Matthew 28, 19. And this is Jesus talking about the the Great Commission. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, and the, and the other guy, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the next one. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan so filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of that land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, it was, uh, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to whom? To Who did he lie to? The Holy Spirit. He lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God. Let's go to the next one, Luke 3, 22. By the way, it's interesting that the only thing that God killed somebody for in the New Testament was lying about that issue, finance stuff. Luke 3, 22, it says this, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him, 
in bodily form like a dove, and the voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Now this is a picture of the Trinity in action, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, not as a dove, but like a dove, like it's a picture, it's a simile. It's a picture descending like a dove. He's not flying around the room this morning. You see a little white dove going. That just, you know, it's, it's a symbol. The Father's voice from heaven declaring, this is my son, Jesus, in bodily form, being baptized with whom I am well pleased. The Godhead, all three in action in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit is God. The second thing, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an it. Oftentimes, we refer to the Holy Spirit, well, it. It did this, and it did that. And a lot of times, we're referring back to some experience we had at one point in time in our relationship with God, or maybe in a service or in a meeting where the Holy Spirit, we encounter the Holy Spirit in some way, but a lot of times we'll refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. Well, you can't relate to an it. You can try. It doesn't work that way. He is not an it. We are born of the Spirit, created for relationship with the Holy Spirit to be active and involved in our daily life. Now, I'll give you a, kind of an example of an it. When I was in second grade, I had an illness, and I was out of school for several months, and I didn't have a lot of friends because they didn't know really what I had, so they kind of had me a little bit quarantined for a while, and I just was, I guess I must have been lonely because I created a friend. It was a pumpkin, and I named him George. I wrote stories about George, my pet Pumpkin. Friends, a pumpkin is an it. There's only a one-sided relationship with an it. It's your projecting on it all the things you want it to be. The Holy Spirit is not George the pumpkin. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is real and wants to be active in our heart and in our life every day to give you wisdom, to guide you in truth, to comfort you, to lead you, to help you, to help me, to help us do this life that we are called to do and empower us to be able to do it. And the third thing is this, he's not weird. And I know the moment I say Holy Spirit, people are thinking you've got a picture of tambourines or snakes or dressing funny and doing weird stuff. That's not the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, weird people will do weird things with or without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Don't blame the Holy Spirit. Blame the person. I think the Holy Spirit's been blamed for a lot of stuff that weird people have done because they are weird. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. But he gets blamed because a weird person says... X, Y, and Z. Now, all of us have experiences, could be a teaching, could be an experience, could be a conversation with grandma or grandpa or an aunt or uncle or even mom and dad about who the Holy Spirit is. Some of them good, some of them positive, some of them weird. But here's what I want to tell you. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit is not weird. I promise you, he's not a weirdo. He's part of the Godhead. You know what the Bible says about God? That he is the giver of great gifts. Do you know what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit? He's a gift from God. Now, I'm going to put the two together. And the Bible says, if, if you as a dad... Give great earthly gifts, how much more so your heavenly Father who's going to give you the Holy Spirit? So if we say the Holy Spirit's weird, then we're ultimately saying the guy who gave it to us is also weird. 
But most of us in the room, most of us who believe in God, who have a relationship with Jesus, we look at God the Father and say, man, God the Father is like, he's solid. Jesus is solid. Now, if Jesus is solid and God the Father, the one who gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus who said, I'm going to send you somebody, if they're okay and the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, doesn't it stand to reason that the Holy Spirit's okay? That the Holy Spirit is not weird. Weird people, not a weird Holy Spirit. And there is a distinction. I promise you, I've seen weird people in action blaming the Holy Spirit for their weirdness. I'm not into that. I don't want you to be into that. I want you to hear my heart here. I want, this is an introduction to who he is and what he can do, what he does in our life. The Holy Spirit, I promise you, is not a weirdo. He loves you. He is for you. Now, let's move a little bit into the area of what he does. Now, before we do that, actually, I do want to hit this because thinking about the enemy, there is no more prevalent person of the Godhead in action in the New Testament than the Holy Spirit. He is weaved everywhere in the New Testament church. He was an expected part of their experience. Go back and read it for yourself. I'm, you don't have to take it on my face. Go back and read the book of Acts and then to read the rest of it. You'll see the Holy Spirit all throughout the New Testament in action. Also, doesn't it stand to reason that if the Holy Spirit is this involved in the New Testament church and is part of the daily life and expectation flow and rhythm of a New Testament believer, that the enemy would try really, really hard to throw that off course. If I knew, I'm just going to take the, the antagonist approach here. If I knew there was a person in your life who could greatly benefit you and I didn't like you, I would do everything I can and could do to keep you away from that person. That's what the enemy has done. I don't know that there's a more misunderstood person in all of Scripture or misrepresented person in all of Scripture than the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, let's start talking about what he does. Because he's got a lot of functions. And even this morning, I'm not going to hit all of what he does in our life. This is just kind of a, a little bit of an introduction, okay? Here's the first thing he is. Oh, let me get Matthew 13, 35. Before we go there into what he does, I want to say, let's look at what Jesus said. Now, Jesus was who? He was the greatest teacher to ever live, right? We can take what he said and take that thing and take it to the bank. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 35. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet al Open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Now keep that in mind. Jesus, the greatest teacher who will utter things hidden from the foundations of the earth. Now, this same Jesus, we're going to see what he has to say about the Holy Spirit. This same Jesus who is the greatest teacher ever to walk the planet has these things to say about the Holy Spirit. First is this, he will be our advocate and with us forever. This is John 14, 16, and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. He has given us the Holy Spirit, to be an advocate for us and to be with us forever. And in just a few uh, moments, we'll talk about another comment that Jesus made that said, it's better that I go and he come. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is Je these are the words of Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. Here's the next one. He will re reveal the Bible to us, John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, 
the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Scripture. Human hands wrote it, inspired by the Holy Spirit. When you read it, the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates. I'll give you an example. You might read the same passage 25 times. Read the passage, read the passage, read the passage, and then finally, whoa, I didn't see that. I've read this 20 times. I've never seen that before. Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Illuminating Scripture, teaching us, revealing things, showing us. That's part of his, if he inspired the writers to write it, stands to reason again that he can illuminate us as we read it. So why do we need an active relationship with the Holy Spirit? Because we have an active relationship with the Word of God. If we want to see new things that maybe we've never seen before, we need the Holy Spirit to help us in the reading of Scripture. The next thing is that he will testify about Jesus. I love this one. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, he goes out from the Father and he will testify about me. This is, again, Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. We're going to read this from the message, the same passage, because it doesn't just end with testifying about Jesus. It actually takes it, that passage goes a little further, that as he testifies about Jesus, it's going to help us to testify about Jesus even more. This is what it says in verse 26 of the message. It says, when the friend, we all need that friend, I plan to send you from the Father comes, the spirit of truth issuing from the Father, he will confirm, listen to this, everything about me. You too, from your side, must give your confirming evidence since you are in this with me from the start. So he's going to testify about Jesus. Let's go on to John 16, 12 through 15. This is a little longer. I have much more to say to you, more than I can now bear. And this is Jesus saying, hey, listen, I've got so much I want to download to you, I don't have time. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. You see the connection? All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Again, Jesus talking of the Holy Spirit. And when we look at Jesus talking about his relationship with the Father, he says the same thing, doesn't he? He said, I don't do anything that the Father doesn't tell me to do. I don't say anything that the Father doesn't tell me to say. And now what is Jesus telling us of the Holy Spirit who is to come? He's saying he's exactly like me, guys. He's not going to tell you anything that I haven't heard from the Father. In other words, he's a trustworthy source. He's not weird. He is a person, the third part of the Godhead. He is the Holy Spirit. And one of his greatest roles in the life of every believer and those who do not yet believe is to reveal who Jesus is. To testify of him, to testify about him, and to bring glory to him. That's who the Holy Spirit is. And then finally, he's going to convict us of sin. John 16, 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world uh, in regard to sin and righteousness and concerning the judgment. Now, let's wrap this up in the context of worship. First, I'm going to talk about the conviction of sin because we misunderstand this oftentimes. A lot of times we misunderstand the difference between conviction of sin, which is brought by the Holy Spirit, intended to show us something that needs to be resolved or forgiven in our life so that that sin separates us from God, so that that thing that's trying to separate us from God can be removed and that right relationship can, can remain and be established. Versus condemnation, which is from the enemy, who would take the very same thing in our life, same issue, and say, how could you? You're not worthy. God doesn't want you. That's called condemnation. So it could be the same, very same sin, two very different desires, two very different outcomes. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is not an ugly thing. It's more of a gentle whisper. 
hey, hey, come on. I got, I got to have better for you than this. Who is he? He leads us in all truth. He's our advocate. He's our comforter. He's our counselor. He's our paraclete. All of these things. This is who he is. And so when he brings to us something in our life that is sinful, he's just telling us, hey, let's resolve this so that you can continue to move in your relationship with Jesus the way that God desires for your life. Versus the enemy who says, hey, I'm going to condemn you for this. You shouldn't go to church. You certainly can't worship. You're not worthy to come into his presence. Now, let's put this all in the context of worship. What is worship? We're all worshiping something, okay? In the context of our relationship with God, it's worshiping who he is and what he has done. Now, we just learned one of the greatest roles of the Holy Spirit is to testify of Jesus and to glorify him, to lead us in all truth. As we read, illuminate scripture. So when we come to worship, the Holy Spirit is one of the greatest leaders for us to respond appropriately to who God is and what he has done. Because he is revealing Jesus, he is showing us who God is, what he has done, and what that means for our lives personally, which sets our heart in a place where I can now worship based on, they call it revelation, based on the revelation that I've gotten from the Holy Spirit about who God is and what he has done. And I can know that even though I might be convicted of a sin, I don't have to be afraid to come into God's presence because oftentimes when we enter into worship, that's where the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Worship from the context of a setting like this where we have set aside a focused time to focus on who Jesus is and what God has done. And we begin to lift our hands or we begin to worship and sing songs about who Jesus is and who God is and what he has done in our life. And then the Holy Spirit just reminds us, hey, what about this? Does that line up with who he is and what he's done in your life? And we go, oh, no, it doesn't. The enemy in that moment, listen, because we all experience this at one time, or the enemy at that moment says, you better not worship. You better stop what you're doing. You're not worthy. No, listen, the greatest thing in that moment that we can do as we're worshiping God and the Holy Spirit says, hey, you got, what about this? What about this thing? What about this anger? What about this jealousy? What about this root issue in your heart? Envy. What about this? The greatest thing we can do in that moment? Wholehearted surrender. It's yours. So God wants all of you. He wants your successes. He wants your failures just as much. So in that moment when we feel that, the Holy Spirit's, hey, let's deal with this. A lot of times we, we back up and we go like this and say, oh, I just, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to listen to other people worship God, but I'm going to do nothing. Maybe I feel unworthy. But God would want us in that moment to do the exact opposite. What he wants is wholehearted surrender. God, I acknowledge today. I know that I made a mistake. I know this thing in my heart doesn't belong here. I've made it more important than you. God, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Make me whole. Make me new. Here's how the Holy Spirit helps us in worship. Revealing who God is. Showing us things we haven't seen. Helping us deal with the issue of sin in our heart and in our life. And the things that don't belong there that he can reveal to draw us not further not to push us away from God. That's what the enemy wants. He wants to draw us closer to Jesus. Now again, if I am your enemy, I am working overtime to keep you from a healthy relationship with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I understand what I just told you. His vital role in revealing who God is so that we can respond to him appropriately in worship. When we're convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, the devil wants you to go to feel that 
and feel ashamed, to be caught in shame, to be caught in a cycle of shame, and to not worship. The Holy Spirit says, come on, I love you. I'm for you. Worship. Wholeheartedly surrender. Even that thing that you're maybe ashamed of or embarrassed about. Surrender wholeheartedly. Come on, in an attitude of just surrender. Maybe this morning you've come here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And we're here talking about this guy, the Holy Spirit. Who ultimately wants to show you how good God is. He wants to reveal to you how much he loves you, how much he is for you, that he's not against you in any way. Quite the opposite, actually. He would do anything and has already done so to have a relationship with you. And so this morning, I'm not going to prolong this, but if you say, I'm in an atmosphere of worship today, I just need to acknowledge I need this Jesus in my life. I need who he is and what he has done to cover me. I need forgiveness of my sin. I need to be clean and whole. Hey, there's no shame. There's no condemnation. He loves you right where you are. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning, say, Jason, I just know today I've got to respond to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see it. We want to pray with you this morning. Is there anyone here who'd say, yeah, that's me. I see a hand here and another person over here who say, yep, I need Jesus. I believe another person over here who said, I just acknowledge today over in this section right here, I just need Jesus and a person here. Listen, he loves you. He's for you. He desires relationship with you. There's no shame. There's no condemnation. God is here, and he loves you. I'm just going to give this one more moment. If that's you today, say, Jason, today I just need to respond to Jesus. I need to respond to the Holy Spirit. I see another hand over here, another hand here. Come on, why don't we give God a great round of applause for those who responded. It's beautiful. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask uh, everyone, you can go ahead and take your seats. We're going to pray a prayer together. And if you made that decision, we, there's a Connect card on the seat back in front of you. And we also have some team members in the back who have a gift for you. We have a, a book or a Bible that we would love to give you. Uh, the book is called Following Jesus. It's kind of a seven steps. Where do I go from here about how do I move my relationship with God forward? And obviously the Bible is what the Bible is, that it is good and great for you. But we would encourage you. Uh, if you made that decision, if you raised your hand to say, I just need Jesus, we would love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. The greatest decision you can ever make is that decision to follow Jesus. And we're so proud of that decision that you made, that, uh, that you would have a life-giving relationship with him. And so we're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask us all to pray that prayer together, that just inviting Jesus into our heart and into our life. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading me to Jesus. I love you. We honor you. Thank you. I invite you into my heart to be the Lord of my life forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more time, let's give God a great round of applause for those who made that decision. And if you're watching online, we want to say thank you as well for tuning in. And uh, we would love, if you're in the BCS area, we would love for you to be live and in person. But if you made that decision, there's a button you can click that says, I made a decision. We would love to help you find a great local church right where you are. If you are in BCS, we'd love to be that local church that helps you move forward in your relationship with Jesus. But we're so glad that you were with us this morning.